The unique landscape of Cappadocia has become one of the star attractions of Turkey. Cappadocia is a geological oddity of honeycombed hills and towering boulders of amazing beauty. The peaks of three volcanoes, Erceus, Hassan and Melendez Mountains, dominate Cappadocia. It was their eruptions which covered the former plateau of Ergup in ash and mud that provided the region's raw material, tuff, which is formed by compressed volcanic ash. Erosion has worked on this soft stone ever since to form the valleys and curious fairy chimney rock formations for which the region is so famous. The fantastical topography is matched by the human history here. People have long utilized the region's soft stone, seeking shelter underground and leaving the countryside scattered with fascinating cavern architecture. Here many Christians found refuge during the early days of Christianity. Some of the Christians to whom the Apostle Peter wrote his letters lived in Cappadocia. The Apostle Paul traveled widely throughout this region. By the 4th century, Christians fleeing Rome's persecution had arrived in some numbers and established monastic communities here. Come with me on a journey to one of the most important early centers of Christianity, a sanctuary a refuge in the rock shelters from the Romans and later from Muslim raiders, the quest for answers, looking for the first followers of Christ in Turkey begins right now. Cappadocia is now commonly used in the tourism industry to refer to the area that extends roughly from Kaisari West to Aksari covering an area of about 5,000 square kilometers in the center of present-day Turkey. The boundaries of the region have varied throughout history. Cappadocia is a landscape like no other you've ever seen before in your lifetime. It includes dramatic expanses of soft volcanic rock shaped by erosion into towers, cones, valleys, and caves. Rock-cut churches and underground tunnel complexes from the Byzantine and Islamic eras are scattered throughout the countryside. There are buildings in this rocky region of central Turkey that go down to five stories underground and date back to Roman times. Entire underground cities exist here, including churches and cathedrals. Most of the rock houses in Cappadocia that are still inhabited, however, are above ground, dwellings that have been chiseled out of the strange rock chimneys that this area is known for. Some have even been turned into guest houses for those who want to know what it feels like to live here. The best way to take it all in? From above. Cappadocia is known around the world as one of the best places to fly in hot air balloons. The spectacular surrealistic landscapes combined with the excellent flying conditions allow the balloons to gently drift over and between fairy chimneys, pigeon houses hewn into the unique rock formations, orchards and vineyards. Through impressive valleys, each with distinctive rock formations, colors and features, and then to float up over rippled ravines for breathtaking views over the region. Cappadocia balloon tours begin every day at sunrise. As the day is dawning, balloons are inflating. When the inflation is finished, you are welcomed into the balloon. Then it's up, up and away. Balloon flight begins. You go wherever the wind takes you. The sky is layered with air currents, so the pilot heats the air inside the balloon with the burner to rise into currents with different directions. There is a marvelous view of Cappadocia from above. You cannot miss the opportunity for pictures, even a selfie. Your flight time is approximately one hour. You land in one of the many open fields in the area, the experience of a lifetime. Yeah. 
During the hot air balloon flight, a beautiful sight grasps your attention. A unique perspective of Gorm National Park and the rock sites of Cappadocia seen from above. Since 1985, Cappadocia's Gorm National Park and the rock sites of Cappadocia hold the status of a World Heritage Site of the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. At the highest point of Gorm National Park and the rock uh, sites of Cappadocia lies a tall volcanic rock outcrop known as Uchusar Castle. The rocky wonderland has a network of human-created caves Living quarters, places of worship, stables, and storehouses were all dug into the soft stone. Uchisar Castle is the summit where Cappadocia mingles with the clouds. It is the tallest fairy chimney and can be seen from any spot in the region. Gorem National Park and the rock sites of Cappadocia have been extensively used and modified by men for centuries. It is a landscape of harmony combined with human interaction and settlements with dramatic natural landforms. There has been some earthquake damage to some of the cones and the pillars, but this scene is a naturally occurring phenomenon. Overused by tourists and some vandalism have been reported and some incompatible structures have been introduced. This area was inhabited as early as the Hittite era, circa 1800 to 1200 BC. Even today, you can find Hittite-style pottery in Avanos, a town near the World Heritage Site. Because of its central location, Gorem sat uncomfortably on the boundary between rival empires. First the Greeks and Persians, and later the Byzantine Greeks and a host of rivals. This precarious political position meant the residents needed hiding places and found them by tunneling into the rock itself. Due to seclusion and remoteness of the valley, as well as geology that allows for hidden underground dwellings, it has served as a place of refuge throughout centuries of battles and political unrest. Over time, individual villages banded together to resist invading forces and seek refuge in underground communities, which developed in some areas into large subterranean cities. It's known that there are more than a hundred underground settlements in the region, and many of them are not open to visitors. The first inhabitants of the Cappadocia area have opened deep cavities within the volcanic rocks to escape from the attacks of the wild animals in hard winter conditions. Later, the underground cities were the hiding place of the first Christians who escaped from the persecution of the Roman soldiers. They were enlarged to enable, when necessary, an entire city to live and every kind of fixture necessary for the living conditions of the people have also been attached. Even when there wasn't any danger, the people living on the ground have hidden in the underground cities, fearful of danger. For this reason, all the homes at the time were connected to the underground cities with a tunnel. In all of the underground cities, there are ventilation chimneys reaching place by place to a depth of 80 meters down to the underground waters. These chimneys were opened to meet the need of both ventilation and water. Within the cities that are temperate in winters and cool in summers, there are kitchens, cribs, wine houses, depots for cereals, meeting saloons, toilets, and every kind of living space necessary. Within all the cities, there are locking stones, which can only be opened and closed from the inside, protecting against the threats which may come from the outside. Also known as Barry Bakarali, Den Kuryu, the deepest underground city, has about 600 doors connecting the courtyards of surface dwellings to its tunnels and staircases. It is 11 levels according to the National Geograph, descending about 85 meters with an area of a little over 10.4 kilometers squared. It is large enough to have sheltered as many as 20,000 people together with their livestock and food stores. Connected with Durinkuyu, underground city, through kilometers of tunnels, Kaimakla is the widest underground city in Cappadocia and is partially open to visitors. The Kaimakla underground city has low, narrow, and sloping passages. 
while the underground city consists of eight floors below ground in which the spaces are organized around ventilation shafts, only four of them are open to the public today. Around 100 tunnels connect the ancient homes, cellars, stables, kitchens, and storage areas spanning eight underground floors. Here, the early Christians seeking sanctuary from the Romans and later still Muslim raiders found refuge in the rock shelters and began to connect the chimney formations with subterranean villages. When invaders did arrive, Christians are believed to have slipped down through the holes in the ground and remained there until the danger passed. Within the layers of structures, both above and below ground, they had constructed churches, storehouses, homes, and passageways. When the Emperor Constantine issued the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, which mandated toleration of Christians in the Roman Empire, it put an end to the Roman persecution of the Christians. Cappadocia, which had been a hiding place for Christians, became an important center for Christianity. With a large concentration of Christians, Cappadocia became a center of Bible study and was famous for the 4th century theologians it produced. Basil, later Caesarea, Gregory of Nazianzus, and Gregory of Nyssa. In the Middle Ages, the importance of this area again soared and many monasteries, churches, and chapels were dug out of the rock. The best of these still have vivid Byzantine frescoes of religious scenes. For instance, the Gorham Open Air Museum resembles a vast monastic complex composed of scores of refectory monasteries placed side by side, each with its own fantastic church. It contains the finest of rock-cut churches with beautiful frescoes, wall paintings, whose colors still retain all their original freshness. It also presents unique examples of rock-hewn architecture and fresco technique. The area covered by this open-air museum forms a coherent geographical entity and represents historical unity. There are 11 cafeterias within the museum with rock-cut tables and benches. Each is associated with a particular church. Most of the churches in the Gorham Open Air Museum belong to the 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries. Churches include St. Basil's Church, Apple Church, and the richly decorated Buckle Church, which is the oldest and lies just outside the gates of the museum. The best preserved frescoes are in the Dark Church, which has been restored after being used as a pigeon house until the 1950s. Cappadocia, with its beauty and history, is a reminder of the Christian persecution. Christianity endured 300 years of hostility. Early Christians expected suffering. Christ had died on the cross. Therefore, his followers would not expect something different than the martyrdom witnessed by one's blood. The Apostle Peter, writing to Christians who lived in Cappadocia and other areas where they had dispersed from Jerusalem, wrote the following words of encouragement. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and God rests upon you. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Persecution of Christians is a frequent theme in the New Testament. It is predicted in the Gospels and is a recurrent theme in Acts and the letters of Paul. It appears to be part of the occasion of the writing of Hebrews and 1 Peter. In the book of Revelation, persecution is a topic that is referred to with certain frequency. According to much of the New Testament, persecution is a test of faith that reveals the world's true relationship with the Christ movement. The New Testament teaches the following about persecution. The persecution of Christ followers is inevitable. Enduring persecution was a testimony to a person's faith and the truth of the gospel. Persecuted Christ followers were not to retaliate against their persecutors. 
And finally, God will punish persecutors. According to Revelation, the ultimate instigator of persecution is the devil. Despite the Gospel's downplaying of Roman involvement in Jesus' death, Revelation holds Rome, symbolizes Babylon, responsible for the death of many Christ followers. Persecution did not begin with the Roman authorities. The New Testament writings tell of the strife between Jews and Christians, the latter challenging the Jews by claiming to be the new Israel. In the early chapters of Acts, Stephen and James, the brother of John the disciple, became victims of the Jerusalem mob and of King Herod Agrippa, respectively. Indeed, the writer of Luke and Acts appears to go out on his way to reassure the Roman authorization of loyalty and general value of the Christians and the hostility of the Jews toward them. The persecutors and their motives changed in AD 64. On July 19 that year, a great fire engulfed much of Rome. Only four of the 14 quarters of the city escaped damage. Suspicion immediately fell on the Emperor Nero. Was this a madcap way of clearing part of the city to make room for new, magnificent streets and buildings in his honor? Nero, however, managed to deflect blame first, apparently on the Jews, who had a reputation for large-scale arson but also had friends at court, and then on to the Christians. Many Christians, perhaps including Peter, were seized, tortured and eventually martyred in the arena. From Nero's killing of Christians in Rome in AD 64 until 250, persecutions of Christians was mainly local, including the persecutions of Hadrian and Marcus Aurelius. The correspondence between Pliny the Younger and the Roman Emperor Trajan shows that although Christianity was illegal, the law was not routinely enforced. After 250, the persecutions were empire-wide, with the objective of ridding the domain of all Christians. Included were the persecutions under Decius, Gallus, Valerian, and the extended persecution begun by Diocletian in 303. The accession of Constantine to a share of the throne in 306 marked the beginning of a new experience of toleration and even power for Christians in the Roman world. Inflamed rumors, perhaps based on the early Christians' observance of the Eucharist and love feasts, accused believers of cannibalism and incest. One of the leading charges against Christians in the empire was that they were atheists. That is, they did not worship the pagan deities and so did not participate in the social and civic activities that involved homage to them. Persecution often grew out of animosity by the populace rather than from deliberate government policy. Christians were falsely accused of the most dreadful crimes and declared to be the cause of great calamities famine, pestilence, and earthquakes. As they became the objects of popular hatred and suspicion, informers stood ready for the sake of gain to betray the innocent. They were condemned as rebels against the empire, as foes of religion, and pests to society. Great numbers were thrown to wild beasts to be burned alive in the amphitheaters. Some were crucified, others were covered with the skins of wild animals and thrust into the arena to be torn by dogs. Their punishment was often made the chief entertainment at public events. Vast multitudes assembled to enjoy the sight and greet their dying agonies with laughter and applause. Many Christians lapsed under the threat of persecution. The numbers of those who fell away produced a crisis for the church in the 250s. Eventually, the question of whether to readmit the lapsed produced several schisms. The church allowed flight in order to escape persecution and warned against rushing into voluntary martyrdom. The high regard for the martyrs as the heroes of the church and the privileges assigned to them led to the cult of the saints. Under the fiercest persecution, these witnesses for Jesus kept their faith unsullied. Though deprived of every comfort, shut away from the light of the sun, making their home in the dark but friendly bosom of the earth, 
they uttered no complaint. With words of faith, patience, and hope, they encouraged one another to endure privation and distress. The loss of every earthly blessing could not force them to renounce their belief in Christ. Trials and persecution were but steps bringing them nearer to their rest and their reward. Christians were indeed a peculiar people. Their blameless deportment and their unswerving faith were a continual reproof that disturbed the sinner's peace. Though few in numbers, without wealth, position, or honorary titles, they were a terror to evildoers wherever their character and doctrines were known. Therefore they were hated by the wicked, even as Abel was hated by his ungodly brother Cain. For the same reason that Cain slew Abel, did those who sought to throw off the restraint of the Holy Spirit put to death God's people. It was for the same reason that the Jews rejected and crucified the Savior, because the purity and holiness of his character was a constant rebuke to their selfishness and corruption. From the days of Christ until now, his faithful disciples have incited the hatred and opposition of those who love and follow the ways of sin. Martyrdom is a regular, ongoing feature of church life in the 25% of global Christianity that we call the underground church, as claimed by the late David Barrett of the World Evangelization Research Center. In one part of the globe, over 10,000 Christians have been killed every year since 1950 due to clashes with anti-Christian mobs, infuriated relatives, state-organized death squads, and so on. Maybe you, watching this program right now, are facing retaliation because of your love for Christ. Maybe your life has not been endangered, but your job, your emotional health, your family are facing harassment because of your devotion to the man of Nazareth. Please, don't give up. Hang in there. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, said, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. As the martyrs, the heroes of faith who have gone before you, rested in the promise that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. You can rest in this promise also. The martyrs didn't renounce their faith. They kept going under pressure and fire, having their eyes upon Christ and the heavenly country that He is preparing for those who love Him and are waiting for His coming. Friend, Jesus is so close. He is here right now with you and soon will be with you forever in the new earth. So hang on in our blessed hope.
Father and our God, we thank you for the precious promises that you give us. Lord, you are faithful. You've promised that you would be there for us always, through the good times, through the hard times. We especially pray today for those who may be experiencing persecution, perhaps uh, in their family, with respect to their job or in their social circle. Father, I pray that you would give them courage Help them to stand for you, though the heavens fall. And we pray that you would keep all of us faithful to you until that glad day we will see you face to face. Father, we commit our lives to you afresh this day. Thank you for hearing us and for loving us in such a way that you will never give up on us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear friend, thank you so much for watching us today. Don't forget to share with your friends and relatives the quest for answers looking for the first followers of Christ and Turkey. Please visit our website. On our website, you can leave us a message, your prayer request, and order a copy of today's show or the complete series. If you feel moved to support our ministry, you can make your donation on our website as well. I hope to see you soon.